Hey everybody, welcome to The Process. Today we're gonna to talk about good clients versus bad clients. Stick around. Let me try this again. I want you guys to listen to me. Yeah. I design sandwiches. My name is Jose Caballero and I talk about the business of design. <laughs> the des I talk about a lot of stuff. My name is Chris Doe and I talk about the business of design. At the center of this operating system, it's about understanding. <clears throat> Jose, can we just tell them what the show title is? I hate you, dude. You are watching The Process. Let's start off with the bad clients first, the ones that we're all gonna wanna gather around the campfire and complain about. So this like, what the, are bad clients? These basically. are the designer's favorite things to talk about, bad clients, Ooh. let's talk about it. Whenever I meet somebody and a client wants me to prove myself to them, I already get a bad feeling, that's a sign right away, this is gonna be a bad client because they feel mm. like you have to prove something to them and that doesn't work well with my personality type. And a long time ago, I was invited to meet with somebody, a creative business partner, and as soon as I walked in the door, he's like, so what are you gonna do for us? Mm. That was off-putting right then and there, so I wrote off that entire business meeting as this is not, not gonna be productive for me, and so then I left. That was it. Dang, dude, that fast? You're like, that you fast. got bad vibes? Yeah, it's Ow. like, you don't meet somebody brand new and say, what can you do for me? I, I measure the bad client from a vibe standpoint. So for example, if you walk into a room and the client you know, might come in and say, you know, congratulations on your work, you do great work, that sets up a really good vibe uh, versus somebody coming in and saying, you know, wow, you guys are really expensive. So that segues yeah. perfectly into my own observation about clients that talk about rates versus value. How many hours will it take for you to do something Versus. Versus what's the value of what I'm creating. Interesting. So they, they always want to pin you into a, 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 a time and a, and a rate. Yep. And I don't like to work that way because hourly rates diminish the value of what you provide. If a client is coming into a, an initial meeting already talking about like the scope and the, and the timeline and the budget, they don't understand what's really important in a project. They're not separating the goal of their business from the tactical. A great client gets you excited about working for them, gets you excited about what their vision is for what they're about to do, versus like you know dealing uh, with the little small details like the cost well, and stuff. Well, I, I don't mind talking about the money, and there's a difference between talking about money and hourly rates. I want to talk about money upfront at the very beginning if possible, because I don't want to spend an hour and a half talking to you about your project and to learn that you have four thousand dollars for a four hundred thousand dollar project. That's a waste of my time. So what you may call tactical, I look at it like, let's just talk about the budget for this project. Let's not talk about hours though. What do you okay. have to spend against this marketing initiative? What, what, do you, what resources do you have for this undertaking? That's what I wanna know. So my first bad client is what I call the Pete Campbell producer. He or she is interested only in themselves and they really are climbing the career ladder internally at their agency and they don't have a lot of experience. So they're gonna front and then they're gonna really treat you, like grind you until you get done what you need to get done. Yeah, I, I think what's happening there is they're overcompensating and I generally just get really negative vibes with people who front, who pretend, or pretentious. They're just trying to act and they're, it's obvious to everybody in the room. And this, this is just about being a real human being. Say but that you don't know. Two is the squirrel CEO. It's the CEO who comes in and says, here's what I want, squirrel and they change their mind every like five seconds. The epitome of uh, what's called shiny object syndrome. That person wants a unicorn. They don't have a real like direction on what they want to do. And the final one is somewhat related to the squirrel CEO <laughs> is the Donald Trump CEO. Why are you laughing? The Donald squirrel, the, the Donald Trump CEO is kind of like the I'm better than you. I know how to do this. Let me tell you how you should do this. There's a lot of bluster, but not enough substance. So but it's gonna be huge. It's going to be huge. Gonna, right. And, and keep in mind, they might have the budget. <laughs> Don't spit all over me. They might have a huge budget. Or, or they say they have a huge budget, but they really don't, or they don't want to pay that. Or even if they do, it's going to be a pain in the ass to do it no matter what. All right, so I have a longer list of bad clients. Maybe I've had a lot of clients, and I, I made some observations here. So micromanagers, people who tell you what to do and how to do it are horrible clients for me. Tell me what you want, tell me how to do it, but don't tell me both because then you negate my ability to contribute to the project in a creative and a meaningful way. So I don't work well with micromanagers. Another bad client is a client that has unreasonable expectations and a clear lack of boundaries. They expect you to work 24 seven and so they'll call you on a Sunday night to ask about something that's due on a holiday Monday. They have no boundaries and their expectations are to me unreasonable. A bad client gives obscure feedback and the famous line is, I'll know it when I see it. Another way that they mask this is by saying things like, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this. So they spend a lot of time talking about the very negative aspects but they don't give you any positive direction as to what they really want. 
So it's very easy to tell people what you don't want. It's a lot harder to kind of think about and articulate what it is that you want. Bad clients think everything is easy and they start the phrase with something like this. How hard would it be to do this? How hard would it be to do this? And they needle you through revisions after revisions because you say it's not hard to do and then you trap yourself into saying, well, if it's not hard to do, why don't you just do it? Clients that are indecisive, they solicit opinions from a lot of people. I want to work with somebody who knows what it is that they want. They might not be able to say it always, but they know what they want. They're not gonna go and poll their neighbor, the, the uh, PTA association. They're not gonna ask their wife or their kid, what do you like? Because that's a person who has no clue as to what they want. And if they don't know what they want, I would say have the courage to say, you know what, I really don't know, so I just trust you. So guide me through this process and make a recommendation based on what you know about us. Really bad client. They get personal and they make personal attacks on you and they clearly cross the boundary of not talk about the work anymore. They might make derisive comments about you, like you're lazy, uh, you have bad ideas, and they're really attacking you personally. People say like, I hired you to make this better, why are you making it worse? Well, that's not really helpful to anybody. No. And I thought you were the best, and this is what you're gonna give me? Like, this is total hack work. So I like to say this isn't working for me, let's try to work towards the goal. I think there's some dark side to them that makes them feel better by breaking somebody down on an emotional, personal level. Mm -hmm. And I find that they do this because they know artists have very fragile egos. So when you attack somebody personally, it'll make the person go away and generally speaking, will want to do more and even harder, like work harder and do more work for them. The other client is the one that is very opaque versus transparent. You can never tell what they're thinking and they mask a lot about what they're feeling or the pressures that are going through and it's the old poker face syndrome. You don't know if the work is good, you don't know if the work is bad, they just don't say a whole lot. And really, that breaks down the whole, this is a collaborative spirit and we're gonna work with each other to make something better. And I can't do that unless we have a real conversation about it. And so in conclusion, the last one I have is a bad client likes to blame everybody and never takes responsibility. It's only good, or it's only their responsibility if it turns out well, but otherwise it's everybody's fault. Like everybody's an idiot, everybody's working to sabotage the entire project, and those are really bad clients. But you know what? I don't believe in victims, I believe in volunteers. So if you have bad clients, it's because you continue to accept relationships that aren't productive and healthy for you and your company, so time to change. So let's talk about the clients you should treat like gold. These are what we would consider the good clients. I like clients who really pick vendors that they trust and know that they're experts and let them do their job. That's really it. A client that trusts you and treats you as an expert is one that you should value. The Zen CEO. This is somebody who is super calm and doesn't necessarily get blustered and who really knows how to pick the right people on their team uh, and is very clear. They're, they're actually, they'll, they'll speak plainly and they'll tell you whether they're happy or not they won't mince words, but they will always do it, not in a non-emotional way, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a mindful and very present way. And for them, it's about the vision and about what they can really do and how cool it's gonna be to collaborate with you. And they have their people usually uh, handle some of the details, but this person is a great collaborator, somebody who's experienced and somebody who is excited about what they're doing, who really can enroll the people around them and helps you, will coach you to actually get the account or get the project, and as the project is happening, will tell you what's going on internally at his company and how you should maneuver. That's a real partner. That's somebody who really cares about your well-being as a designer or as an agency. Okay, so if the client's willing to trust you, they're also going to trust and heed your advice. A great client's going to solicit opinions and your thoughts and kind of factor that into the decision making, and you can tell they're, they're taking it like almost even stronger than their own opinion and their own instincts. It's a good sign that um, there's, a, there's a famous quote from Steve Jobs who was like, a, a player hire A plus players, B player hire C players. You always hire better than you and you trust those experts to lead you down a good path, okay? There's no point in hiring the world's greatest architect or the world's greatest designer only to then tell them how to design. Clients that value design as a competitive advantage are golden to have. They see that design is more than sauce that you pour over a faulty product or services or a website. They look at design as a differentiator. And so the clients that see that value also see you as valuable and you're gonna have a great relationship working with them. Great clients are really fair. Mm -hmm. And you can tell how they run their organization, how they treat their staff and employees as, to, as a sign as to how they'll treat you. Rarely is it somebody that is so inconsistent that they'll beat down their own staff and employees and then treat you like gold. So I'd like to describe it as great clients are servant leaders 
versus boss dictators. So they're in the trenches with their team, they're in the grind, they're working with them, and they see the pain point, and they share that with their team, and they don't sit there from an ivory tower and send commands down the line. Great clients are really open-minded. They don't bait you into the conversation saying we're really open to change, but every time you present something new and slightly different than what they're already doing, pull back, and they keep pulling back. Great clients truly are open-minded and really want to hear what the solutions are, even if they sound nothing like what they had previously planned on. Great clients are very social. What do I mean by that? I don't mean that they go out in the town and have drinks with their friends, but I mean that what they do is they tend to share stories about how great you are mm -hmm. and how great it is to work with you. They like to extol the virtues of the people that make them look good. They're not gonna take the credit, they're gonna share the credit, and they're gonna lead you to a lot more work. For me personally, this is a reflection of who I am and my culture. I really like to work with people who are focused on business. And the way I look at it is, <clears throat> I'm a designer, and my skill sets complement a business person. They really get into sales and marketing, business-oriented goals, and they leave the creative aspects up to the designer, and that's a good compliment for me. And conversely, I find that creative clients are the worst clients to have. It's really weird. I, I know it's not like some design self-hatred thing, but they're the worst clients to have. And the reason is they don't value their time. They look at creativity as just a byproduct of breathing. So they look at you as like, this is easy to do, just do it. Or what they do is like, scoot over, let me work on this with you. And then I'm just a mouse jockey. I'm just gonna move things around and say, oh, you want a little bigger, a little bit smaller? And what's happening is I'm shutting down my brain and I'm no longer going to be vested in the solution with you or for you, I'm just doing whatever it is you ask. And so I emotionally, personally, check out. So I like to work with business people, they value the work that I do, they pay a fair thing, they don't expect you to do work for free. Conversely, creative people, on the other hand, tend to do the opposite. Was that your thoughts? The comment is gonna be, you guys have a lot of experience, how does this relate to me? I okay. mean, how do I get like just getting clients? started? How do I get good clients? How do I become you? Mm. How do I become Chris Doe? <laughs> Chris Doe. <laughs> I think what happens is everything that I'm saying, everything that Jose is saying is kind of within your gut. You already know these things, but what happens is you choose to ignore that gut feeling, the red flags that go up, and you choose to ignore them at your own peril. It's like when you're walking down a dark alley and some sketchy person comes up to you, you know to be on alert and you know you should be in defensive. You don't go sit there walking around whipping out your iPhone and your wallet and your Rolex. You don't do that. You kind of are in protection mode. And there's a good reason. But somewhere in the corporate world, within the confines of business and the natural way we interact with people, we let that all go. We let that go and we don't listen to our, our own instincts and our gut and we pay a heavy, heavy toll. You know from the very beginning it's gonna be a toxic relationship. You can talk about men or women in a dating relationship, you can talk about professional relationships, it's the same. Trust totally your gut, the same. trust your gut, it's and if totally you don't, when it happens to you, I'm not gonna sit there and say I told you so, but pay attention to what happens and make a note of that so you don't repeat the same mistake. Yeah, that's a really good analogy. Dating is a great analogy. G getting good clients is like dating and finding the right person. You have to really, you know, get used to it. And there's gonna be bad dates. You're gonna have bad clients, like we just noted. Those are all from experience. I mean, my summary is, is this, is um, there are no bad clients. You attract, you know, the clients that you get. So, well, they're bad clients. Well, and they're ugly clients, too. No, no, too. hold on. Well, what I mean by, the, here's a conceptual paradigm that, I, that I'm talking about when there is no bad clients. Uh, your degree of self-awareness will determine what choices you make. So you're saying there's people that out of fear choose a bad client who's gonna beat them up or abuse them or like people you've seen like be abused by a client. Um, that's your own fault is my point. So mm. seek to develop the self first. And the second part is, you know, if you define yourself, then define your journey. Like what is the journey that I wanna take? Who are the clients that I wanna have? We get ourselves into positions where it seems like the only choice we have is to pursue bad clients meaning we put ourselves into a financial position or we talk ourselves into like, uh, I'll just do this one thing and it'll happen like this, right? We, we con ourselves into thinking and going against our own instincts and that's really to your own peril. Personally, for me, if I can do whatever I can to keep my overhead low, especially if I'm just starting out, which is what I would do, it gives me a lot more power to be able to say no and no is an incredible, powerful word. The question is, uh, can you be somebody who can be who can hook up with any type of client. Like, you can really connect with almost all the clients that we're talking about, like the Donald Trump client, great. You know, <laughs> my personal belief is, no. That the more self-aware you are and you become, the more mature you become, 
you're very Christo, you're really very binary, no to that person, yes to that person. You're very protective of your energy and of your space. There's no point in, like for what, for the money? We have actually literally walked away from a million dollar job, not a figurative term, a literal million dollar job, because I got the wrong vibe from the client, they were being evasive and dodgy, and it was the very first meeting, I already knew that this is going to set the tone for the rest for of the For the rest of the relationship. And yeah. I was even asking difficult questions, I was asking very straightforward questions, and then I got the wrong feeling. So we got in the car, I told my EP, I don't care what the budget is, I don't care if it's $10 million, we're not working with this client, because we're never gonna get this client, and it's gonna be torture for all of us the entire engagement. So there are times when you listen to that and you just say no. It looks like I'm a very binary person and I'm just like yes or no, yes or no, which I am at the end of the day, but there's a lot of shades of gray in between because we work with a wide variety of clients from pet food to electronics, all kinds of clients because I wanna do good work for people. Really, so then the criteria isn't in the project itself, it's really in the relationship that I'm trying to build. So if I meet a client that's really high maintenance, that's going to be uh, the nitpicky uh, executive, I can work with them. And what I need to know then is, I'm gonna start feeling resentful about taking on this client because I'm not getting paid enough. But at some point, they're gonna pay me so much money, call me on a Saturday, because that's what I signed up for. The problem is when that, the boundaries and the, the rules of engagement aren't defined at the beginning of the relationship, mm. that's when it becomes really problematic. Oh. I now know when a client's gonna be really nitpicky and really kind of jump in into every detail, I just charge them appropriately. I'm very happy to do the work, call me all the time. Blair Enns talks about this, he says basically the reason why you're resentful when a client calls you is because you haven't charged enough. His solution, very simple, what is it? Charge more, that's it. Thanks for tuning in for this episode of the good, the bad, and the ugly, or the good client versus the bad client. Please like this video if you like it, comment below, and subscribe if you like our channel. See you guys next time. Mm -hmm.